Welcome to the beekeeping colony collapse talk. My name's Sean Ananko. I've been a beekeeper for about eight years. And uh, so today we'll talk about, I think the most important thing for us to discuss is what the bees do. And so you guys can understand why it's so important that we understand what colony collapse is and how it's going to affect us if we don't address the problems that are facing us today. But to give you a little bit of history about myself, uh, I'm a farmer. I've been farming for about 10 years. Um, I work at the largest school garden in Morristown where we teach students within the Morris School District. We have 11 buildings, so it's pre-K through 12th grade. And we teach kids about where their food comes from. So we have them come to the farm. We do field trips with them. And they get to see what it actually looks like to grow food, see a vegetable growing on a plant, or see uh, a leafy vegetable growing out of the ground, pull a carrot out of the ground. It's amazing how many kids haven't seen that happen or, and when they experience it, they enjoy eating in a totally different way. When I became a beekeeper, I was at a crossroads in my life. I was working at a health food store start and seeing this call to action for beekeeping. People were, CCD was just coming out. People were talking about how the bees are dying and I thought, well, well, that's a great way to help out. I can do that as a hobby, part-time, and I'll collect some bees. So I started beekeeping and found that it changed my life. Where how I saw how a hive works together as one being is the same way that humans can work together to kind of change the things that are happening in our world. So we'll go, I'm going to go into that process with the bees right now. So, a colony lives in what's called a Langstroth box, right? It's that typical box that you see, three tiers. Um, inside is 60,000 bees. 80% um, of those bees are workers or females. 20% are males or drones. And then you have one queen. Each year, the hive works as a single being. In the springtime, it separates. So a new queen is left behind, and an old queen goes out and she starts a new colony. It's called a swarm. So she's taking about 30% of the bees with her, and she's starting a new. Somewhere else in a tree, a soffit of a house, an old barn. Maybe a beekeeper will collect that swarm and put it into a new box. Uh, but the old queen, the new queen that gets left behind, starts her journey. And she starts by going on a two-week mating flight. And so every day, she'll go out and fly up to a drone conjugation area. So it's basically two miles up in the air where a bunch of boy bees are hanging out and the queen's going up there to get mated. So she'll mate with about 12 different drones during that time and the drones pass on after they've mated. <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> queen comes back and she won't leave again until that swarm cycle happens the following year. She has fertilized eggs to live up for, to five years, and she will lay about 1,500 eggs a day. Uh, and the queen and the worker bees together decide on what kind of egg is fertilized. So the, depending on the size of the cell that the bee lives in, will depend on what kind of worker bee or drone bee comes out. So a smaller size, you get a female bee. Larger size, you get a male bee. So inside a frame of bees looks like this. There's probably, I would say, 200 bees on that frame. And underneath that frame, uh, underneath all those bees, are what we call the brood chamber. So those are all the eggs that the queen is laying. She's laying her brood in the center of the colony. And then on the outside of the colony is where they're going to collect their pollen and their nectar. The hive um, works to keep the whole body homeostasis at a constant like 92 degrees. So it's very important for the eggs to be in the center. Um, the worker bees have many roles. They're doing all, the females are doing all of the work. They are gathering water. There, there are bees that are receiving the honey. So when the honey comes in from the flowers, it gets passed on to a bee that's sitting at the entrance of the hive. And then that bee is going to take that honey and place it in the closest cell possible. 
and then at night is when they'll start to re-manipulate their hive. They'll move the honey that was received and place it up into a honey super, or a storage area. So this is how beekeepers are able to collect more honey. The more space that you give a hive, the more honey, in theory, you can collect. You also have bees that are in control of fanning the hive, keeping it at that constant temperature of 92 degrees, very similar to our bodies. Uh, we have the defender bees, so you actually have like a line of guard, little female guard bees sitting at the entrance and they're checking each bee that flies in and they're checking for that pheromone that's attached to their colony because the queen has a scent and that's what they're all attracted to. We have the scout bees. So the scout bees and the forager bees are very important. The bees communicate through a dance called waggle dancing. And what it does, it, what they do is they come back from a location and they'll shake their abdomens in a direction like left and right and then they'll spin around up and down. And what they're doing is they're signaling to the colony a GPS location. They have a third eye on top of their head so they coordinate themselves with the hive location where they were out in the field, and where the sun is up in the air. And this is telling the bees, the forager bees, where there's a food source. And this was the scout bees mission, was to tell the forager bees that signal. And the bees wait for enough scout bees to come back to give the same type of signal to where they say, okay, that's a really great food source. There's a lots of dandelion growing right there. I'm gonna go fly there. We're gonna get, bring in a whole bunch of honey. So here in the center is our queen bee. She's got a longer abdomen. And like I said before, she's laying 1,500 eggs a day. Um, any egg can be turned into, any fertilized egg can be turned into a queen. Um, what the metamorphosis cycle of the different bees goes like this. A queen live, will have a metamorphosis cycle of 16 days. From the time that the egg is laid and fertilized, it gets fed a diet of royal jelly for the entire 16 days. Royal jelly is a protein that the bees excrete from the top of their heads. And then this rich protein is what determines that that egg has enough energy to turn into a queen. And she spins a half a cycle of a cocoon so that her abdomen is free of any like papery substance so that when she emerges, um, she's ready to go to work. The worker bee, the female bees, have a metamorphosis cycle of 22 days. They get fed the royal jelly from, from day one to day three. And at that point it stops and then they start feeding at different proteins. Proteins that they're gathering from pollen that they make, um, that they ferment in their guts, turn into what they call bee bread and then feed it to their young so that the, um, they get a healthy protein source so they can build up their exoskeleton and they can build up their muscles to get ready for their many adventures that the worker bee has to do. Like I was saying, the defending, watering, there's bees that are taking out the dead ones that are inside the hive. The bees have the ability to know if a cell is doing poorly, like so if a young is not doing what it's supposed to, it's not reading, rearing correctly, they'll pull that cell out and then they'll discard that larva. Um, and then we have the drone bees who have a metamorphosis cycle of 25 days. And that's the same thing, day three, stops royal jelly, so on through the rest of their cycle, they get fed the bee bread. So that's a picture of our drone. The drones don't have any stingers, so they can't defend themselves. So um, and they also, since they have such a big face, they really aren't set up to do any foraging for flowers or pollen or nectar, so they don't even feed themselves. They let the females feed them. <coughs> and then basically their role is to spread the hive's genetics. So you want to have good genetics in your hive so that when you're 
manipulating or populating bee co colonies, um, you're spreading good genetics so that there's a diversity in our environment. In this way, people, um, the hives are not as susceptible to a lot of the diseases that I'm going to get into. So it's important to have a nice, healthy drone. In the winter time, which we're just coming out of, the drones don't hang out for the winter. Like uh, a colony clusters together and they consume the food stores that they collected throughout the year. <coughs> the drones get kicked out in October, November, and then they're reborn again the next year. So they don't get to hang out for the winter and get fed and relax. They end up dying. Um, all right, so a lot about pollination, right? So 30% of the bees that are flying are collecting pollen. Um, they do about 50 flights a day and 300 flowers per, 350 flowers per flight. A bee can carry up to three times its weight in pollen and um, they're collecting pollen not to pollinate our plants, but because they're driven to this idea, they're driven to the flowers by color and they need that protein source. The fact that they're pollin pollinating our flowers and plants is completely by accident. And they're doing it without doing any harm to our environment. They're completely, they don't make any indentation on our ecosystem. They're only supporting our ecosystem. The nectar that's being collected, they have 70% um, of the bees are flying collecting nectar, doing again 30 trips per day, visiting 1,500 flowers, which will only equal about an eyedropper's worth of honey. Um, a full load of nectar can weigh up to 80%, 85% of the bees' weight, and the nectar is used for the honey's um, energy source. So we have the pollen is their protein, and we have the honey as their carbohydrate. So when the bee, when the worker bee is living from day one up until day 15, it's getting fed a diet of solely pollen, solely protein, so it's building up its muscles. And during that time, it's tending to the hive. It'll tend to the larvae, it'll tend to the queen, and it'll tend to the um, young that is being born. And as they get older, day 15 up to day 45, is when their um, roles kind of start to turn into different places. Like they may be designated as a water bee, they may be designated as a defender bee, they may be designated as a forager. But every bee at the end of its life gets to be a scout bee. Now the bees have, from what I've been reading this year, the bees have the ability to, to know how um, healthy their source of nectar and pollen is coming in. So they can judge a site based on that. So when the pollen and nectar actually come into the hive and they start to produce young and get energy from it, if they realize that a certain flower source has a better protein level or a better carbohydrate level, they will flock to that site first. Just, and that is a communication that they're doing internally just by seeing how well their hive is doing. No manipulation by humans or anything. So it's important that we have a healthy food source for these creatures. Honeybees account for a third of our food. So picture a shopping market without cranberries, blueberries, watermelons, tomatoes. We would have less alfalfa um, what are the others of the good ones? Eggplants, peppers, um, almonds, $4.8 billion industry relies solely on the honeybee. And they have monocultures of almonds getting sprayed with hundreds of chemicals. And yet we're putting our bees right there in the middle of them, say, pollinate guys and then we're gonna pick you up and move you off to the next place. And when I think about that, I'm thinking about my diet, right? Everybody likes to eat something that's a little diverse. We're not gonna eat the same thing every day, otherwise we feel kind of sick of it. That's what we're doing to these honeybees when we put them in these monoculture setups. We're saying, feed only on these almonds. I don't care about 
how else you were doing, give me almonds, and then we're going to pick you up, put you on a tractor trailer, and we're going to move you somewhere else. Put you on, um, I believe they go down to uh, California or Florida, they go down to Florida and they do our oranges next. And then we're going to move them up to cranberries, and we're going to move them up to blueberries. And each time, the beekeepers that are doing these um, monoculture type migratory beekeeping methods, um, they're stuck in the system. Like they can't get out of it. They have to pay their bills. But at the same time, the farmers are spraying for these chem they're spraying chemicals on their crops so their crops will grow. But we're not thinking about what how's that damaging the bees. They have some 70% losses when they show up to new locations. And then they um, you can feed honeybees sh sugar syrup to help like invigorate their growth so that they start rearing new young. So they feed them corn syrup. And then they just walk down. Um, so if you had colonies stacked up in a row, you can have a big jug of corn syrup in a trailer and you can just pump it in to each hive like it was a gas tank. And then you just walk down, they suck up the corn syrup. We know how bad high fructose corn syrup is, and move on to the next location. Bees boost up their they boost up their population, they start pollinating, and then they repeat the process over again. Uh, and it's a very fragile system. There is not a lot of leeway. So one day if the bees aren't there to pollinate these crops aren't going to get what they need. And because we destroy a lot of our habitats, we don't even have the native pollinators out anymore. And a lot of the conversation is about the honeybee because it's so popular because of honey. But in fact, our native pollinators do more of the pollination than the honeybee. So we, we've, we've destroyed our ecosystems around the farms and poisoned them. And now we are just slowly poisoning the honeybee as well. So, the honeybee's health and threats. So the honeybee is hygienic in nature. And as I was saying, all of those things that the bee does inside the hive, they have no immune system. So one bee by themselves cannot survive. It needs the whole, it needs all 60,000 of them for the hive to survive as a whole. And that was one of my like, aha moments when I was reading and, just, and learning about honeybees was that like we as a civilization can't really survive by ourselves. We rely on our families and friends for a lot of the things that we do during the day. And the same thing with the honeybee, you know, it can't survive by itself. The immune system of the hive is the hive, the whole hive. They collect a protein uh, called propolis, which they collect from sap from trees. And that propolis has an antimicrobial and, and um, immunity um, uh, components to the hive so that they pretty much coat every, or, um, every like access point. So that it acts as a glue. It glues the whole hive together. And then they'll rely on that propolis to help um, boost their immune system. They'll consume it when they're young. And they'll also use it to clean out their hive. After every bee is born, they have to collect propolis and then line the cell that the uh, bee was born with, born from, with propolis. Um, and that's a way to keep the uh, hive more clean. So now we get into our treated seeds and untreated seeds. So thinking an untreated seed, right? Um, one that's grown naturally in nature or somewhere where you purchase it where you knew the farmer. The bee pollinates that flower, it goes back to the hive, it's healthy, it's happy, and it continues on each year. But where we get our treated seeds, um, that chemical is transmitted through the flower, passed into the pollen and nectar. The bee takes that and brings it into the colony. Now the colony, everybody is sharing what, has, what is being brought into the hive. So when a bee, like I was saying before, you have that receiver bee. So the bee is bringing in the honey, passing it on to one bee. It's consuming it in its gut and then regurgitating it and passing it on to the next bee. 
and that's happening with everything that comes into the hive. So if that honeybee found a food source that's loaded with those treated seeds, they're bringing in small doses of chemicals into their hive. And maybe not at first does it make a difference, but over time is where you start to see these bees start to collapse and they start to get infected by various different diseases. The, spun, um, the comb is like a sponge. It's going to suck up everything, all the toxins and chemicals in nature. So, point there, treated seeds, bad. And here are some of our pests. We have a wax moth that, con that lives in the hive, it's, has always been there, but when the bees are weak, the wax moth takes over and it consumes, the, it actually consumes the comb. The little larva lays its eggs, turns into a moth, and makes a huge looking like net that you, like those nets that you see in trees that waxy, that papery tree moth, tree moth, yeah. And over time the bees are like, well I can't defend this anymore and they collapse. You have uh, the small hive beetle, again another pest that's always been around, but what they do is they'll start laying eggs with inside the cells. And so they'll start taking up space and then the bees won't be able to defend themselves against the small hive beetle and eventually the beetles will run your hive and the bees will leave or collapse. And then you have the Varroa destructor, which probably gets the most press from all of our beekeeping colony collapse disorder articles that you find around these days. This insect um, is a tick and it's sucking out the lifeblood from the hive, from the bee. It's the size of, if you were compared to a human, it's the size of a dinner plate on our body. And that's what this little guy is doing, is on a bee. Now the, the varroa mite will transmit diseases, and that's the biggest problem. She will lay eggs, the varroa mite lays eggs within the cell of the honeybee, mostly the worker bee, uh, mostly the drone bees, and she emerges with like five or ten um, young. And then they start attaching themselves. There's usually only one female to that five or ten that are born. The males will kind of attach themselves to a forager bee or a scout bee and get a chance to go populate other hives in other places. But in the process of the varroa mite being there, it's going to transmit a winged virus. It's going to transmit um, a gut virus um, called nosema. And the winged virus is called uh, shriveled wing disease. And over time, that varroa mite will take out a colony very quickly. When I got into beekeeping, um, I get a lot of slack for this because I don't use any treats, treatments in my hive. I don't introduce any chemicals at all. I, was, I asked myself, I went to a seminar and I saw this guy put on a hazmat suit, big you know, mask for his face, and he used a very toxic chemical called formic acid where he had to wear thick rubber gloves to pour in his hive, seals it up, it smokes, the varroa mites that are on the bees drop out, you scoop them up, but the varroa mites that were inside the cells stayed alive. So you're still going to have varroa mites be born. So my, um, I was like, well, I'm not doing that. So I started researching other methods of controlling the varroa mite because, again, he was, the varroa mite's always been here. It's just now that the bees are sicker because of the poisons we're putting in our environment that he becomes a problem. So the, the main thing to do is since the varroa mite lives on the cycle of bees, you break that brood cycle. So I'll either remove a queen or I'll take one colony in midsummer and make it into two. So this way at least portion of the hive isn't making eggs for a good four weeks and then the varroa mites don't have anywhere to lay their eggs and then their numbers will just die out naturally. So this is a picture of one of my boxes at the end of winter where uh, that looks like wax moth damage and a mouse had gotten into my hive. But you could see that the whole thing just crumbles. You have nosema, which is a fungal infection, which causes disorienta disorientation and digestive problems. 
So the bee doesn't know where the food source is anymore. And it's having problems digesting food, so then it also is getting sick. It's, based, it, it's like a, a cold where you're throwing up all the time. Um, European fowl brood is a parasite that competes with the larva for your food. So it's a parasite that lives on the larva and places itself in the tracheal, um, tracheal tube of the larva so that it stops the food to coming to the gut and it just consumes the food before it gets to the gut of the larva. And then you have American fowl brood, which I've never seen, but it's very, um, it can carry really quickly. It, you can get a huge outbreak of it. And so if you notice it, a beekeeper has to burn their hives. So again, this is if the bees are weak, these become a problem. And it's the same type of bacteria. It's a, it's a, instead of a parasite, it's a bacterial infection doing the same thing, stopping the food from getting to the bay. And then chalk brood, which is a fungal infection, which the bees' larvae look like little mummy, mummies. And it, they just kind of, they, they suck up. The fungal infection sucks up all the life out of the um, bay. Get all viruses are present in our environment before we started becoming aware that these things are problems. Um, before we started spraying a lot of pesticides in our environment. So the bees were able to take care of themselves for generations. It's only now that we're becoming, these are, things are becoming a problem. So that brings us to this colony collapse disorder. And so it's not just one thing. It's a recipe of all of these things coming together that is destroying our colony. And I feel that it's, um, oh, okay. So, so a number of reasons why the colony collapse disorder happens is there's poor management practices. Beekeepers are, these migratory beekeepers are putting stress on our bees. Uh, we have a diversity issue happening in um, queen rearing operations where beekeepers are making queens to pass on to hobbyist beekeepers and to the migratory beekeepers. They're getting their queens are coming from the same gene pool, a very toxic area, and there's no diversity. So the bees aren't, they don't, they're not getting any, uh, a chance to kind of rebuild their immune system because we're just saying, okay, this is one kind of bee that makes honey. This is one kind of bee that may, is gentle. And we're gonna put them together and we're just gonna force them to grow queen sources, rear queens, and then we're gonna spread that out. And so there's queens being reared in California, Georgia, and Florida, and that's it. And so now in the Northeast, a lot of beekeep, there are a few beekeepers in the Northeast that are saying, wait, we can grow queens too, and we're gonna think about our genetic diversity at the same time. So like myself and other beekeepers, we are trying to bring in diverse genetics into our bee yards, and then pass those queens out to the Northeast. And not try to do the whole country, just do our little area. And focus on that, and not try to be this global operation. GMOs, obviously, is a big problem. They take out everything that's good with the plant and put in anything that's gonna help the plant grow or produce a crop. And so when the bees forage on these crops, they're not getting any of the nutrients. So again, we're sick, we're gonna get the bees are not getting the protein and carbohydrates they need, and then they get sick, and then all these things become a problem. Um, and then there comes the chemical uses, and then the chemicals in our environment. There's one main chemical called the neonicotinoid. Um, most of Europe is banned it. It's uh, produced by bear, and it's a systemic pesticide that's coated with the seed, and it's gone up in through the plant. So the plant respirates this pesticide. And if uh, in corn in particular, where the stalk and the stem go out, there's a little pool of water that collects there mostly. And in the morning, the bees will go to that little pool of water and they'll collect their water for the day. But the problem with that is that, like I just said, the plant is respirating this neonicotinoid and we uh, find that low doses start to come into the colony and then over time, they become a problem. So, some combinations, all combinations are, are 
affecting CCD. But what I think CCD is, is that it's a warning sign for us. If we run out of a third of our food, we're going to have a big problem with how we take care of ourselves. We might find ourselves going more towards packaged processed food, which isn't healthy. It makes us sick. Um, so I, I like to think that I, I want to wake up to this and try to help support ecosystems where, so that my honeybees can, or native pollinators can start to flourish again. So we don't have a lot of, we don't have to think about this anymore. I would hate to think that I can't get tomatoes and peppers in the summertime and you know, there's no more blueberries or cranberries because there's no beekeepers to pollinate them. And, and if the almond industry collapsed, that would be a lot of people out of work, which would create a huge problem. So when we see the um, honeybees failing, it's also going to be a failure for, on our civilization because it's going to be really tough to start to live. Well, work's already a problem now. So pesticides are killing our bees. Um, this is a picture of the bee in the wintertime. They come out in the winter and they do cleansing flights. And then they stop on the snow, collect a little water, take a little drink, and then they go back into the hive. Um, I mean, we had a long winter, so most of my hives did pretty well. But at the same time, um, when these bees were out foraging, they weren't the strongest bees coming out. They were pretty weak. So I try to put them, I try to put my bee yards in areas where I know that people are conscious of our environment and we're not spraying chemicals. They're not spraying trees. Uh, nature preserves, things like that where people are thinking about where their sources of flowers and plants are coming from. Um, a lot, we don't know this, but <clears throat> from plants like uh, plants that are purchased at Lowe's and Home Depots are coming from like big um, flower production operations where they're spraying these flowers with lots of chemicals and treating the seeds and again it's that seed coming up through the um, it's coming up through the plant and then going out to the flower and then the bee is bringing it back so most important thing to do is you can know your farmer and know your food I that's something that I think should ring true to everybody at this time of day. There are so many local farmers popping up around the areas, especially what I've seen in New Jersey, where you can actually see where your food's coming from, have a conversation about how it's been grown, and then know what you're putting into your body, which is really important. And then when it comes to flowers, just plant a flower garden. Who cares if it's going to get eaten by deer, or the squirrel's going to take it, or a chipmunk, or a groundhog. Just plant the flowers and let nature kind of take over, you know. Don't have to spray it with a deer stuff or, you know, any other non-toxic chemical. Any chemical I feel that you're spraying is bad. Let the weeds grow. Let your dandelions bloom. Dandelions is the, is the first food source of bees in this area in the spring. And we don't have many chances for food, for honey, for the bees throughout Northeast, in New Jersey in particular, what I'm noticing. So I feel that, you know, dandelions, good thing. A weed is only a plant that is out of place. So if you don't feel that the plant is out of place, then it's technically not a weed. Um, join nature conservancy groups, Xerces Society, um, get wildflower pollinator packs and throw them in yards and places and little corners, you know. You don't have to tend to the flowers and normally just grow by themselves. Uh, you know, and then know about GMOs and don't spray. And if you see people spraying, maybe say something. Say, why are you using Roundup right now? You don't need to. You know, if a weed is growing through the cracks, of your sidewalk, just pick it out yourself. We don't have to be lazy. We can actually work for a better environment. I don't know if I talk too quickly. Um, does anybody have any questions?
Where are the most local apiaries to here? Um, the um, Wayne's Auto Place, the car wash, he has an apiary in his backyard. Really? Yeah. Otherwise, I have a few in Marstown. And then South Jersey is um, a big place for beekeepers as well. Uh, it's called the Urban Farm, and I work for uh, Grow Green Marstown. I get a lot of carpenter bees near my house. Are they uh -huh. still related to the same kind of like family as the regular honeybees and the hive and all that, or are they just like completely separate? They're completely. They're a solitary bee, so they're only they're making that hole, and they're putting um, young in there, and then they're leaving. But they're a pollinator, for sure. But they're separate from the honeybee. The honeybee is the only bee that is going to create this colony, the size that I spoke of today, that's going to bring in honey for a surplus or bring in honey for their food source for the winter time. Most other bees will just collect pollen, pack it on top of their larva, and then the bees emerge in the springtime. And then they start that cycle over again. And then most of the bees just die in the winter. And that's called a solitary bee. The bumblebee is a slightly different where it's a smaller colony um, underneath like piles of sticks, side of your woodlots, woodrows, and they're making a small amount of honey, but not nearly as much as a European honeybee does. Since, the, since bees uh, live in this environment, do they get sufficient food uh, owing to the fact that they live in this industrial area? Or do you have to compensate? Um, I don't think we have to compensate for the lack of food, but I, I feel that we should start planting more flowers and thinking about where our parking lots go and maybe not building, making a new lot, but using an old place, like an old industrial lot. Instead of making a brand new one, let's use the old one and let's keep the new one alive, the old one, like the foraging space alive. Um, bees do have a good amount of food source, but it is harder to have a surplus honey for the beekeeper. Um, most of my hives I do for manipulation and sell bees not really for honey. I like let them keep the honey and I'll just populate more bees. So um, in the university that I used to go to in Berkeley Community College, they had a beekeeping operation also and uh, they compensated for the lack of food by putting cereal mm -hmm. uh, inside, the, inside the... Inside the hive? Yeah, and uh, like you were mentioning earlier, uh, these bees get sick of, uh, of the same food, so would they get sick of eating uh, syrup also? Definitely. And then you think about the syrup, it's just, yes, you made it and maybe you put in some essential oils or some teas in there to kind of like boost it up, but it's the same thing, you're just supplementing. It's like a medication where um, they need a diversity, so they can't just live solely off that sugar syrup. But if you wanted to like boost up their honey to go through winter so that they had larger stores. I do that myself sometimes, but I don't use that as like, okay, I'm gonna put sugar water on the hive all the time. Because I want fresh honey that's full of all the pollen and wonderful nectar that's in our environment to take that in for my immunity. I don't want the sugar syrup for immunity. Any other, you got a hand up? Mm -hmm. from the bugs that you talked about. Is that transmitted into the honey and then we're taking that, we're ingesting that honey? Is that bad for us? No, those fungal infections, they don't make it into our honey source. So at that point, if, the, if that bacteria or fungal infection is, gets to a level where the whole hive is going to collapse and a beekeeper is not going to harvest that honey and feed it to anybody. You're just going to have to throw it out. Um, so, we can, yeah? What are your thoughts on kind of like the uh, commercial honey industry, you know, going to the supermarket and there's a bunch of honey on there? Like, do you think that's, uh, that kind of niche is helpful or harmful for bee populations? I think it's, pro it's probably harmful for the bee populations and for us. They blend that honey with other sources globally 
So it gets shipped around, and then what do we know what China or Brazil is doing with the honey before it comes to the United States? What are they putting in? They heat it up to a temperature where all of the pollen that was in the honey is gone, so we can't even trace where that honey is from. So that brings me back to like, I'm only buying honey from my farmer or beekeeper that I know. Yeah, I noticed in the supermarket there's like some really local stuff that's not really processed. It goes through like a, a small mm -hmm. filtration step and that's just about it. Yeah. And you know, that's what I get, but I just didn't know like the, the bigger brands and stuff you see in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, I, I wouldn't see it as good, but the raw honey is better for us because it's not heated, so anything raw is normally better for us. Um, and I, like I get the creamed honey or the whipped honey yeah. or the stuff that's like really thick. And if you ever want to make it thin again, you could just put it in a pot with some hot water, like the whole container, and then it'll come liquid again, yeah. and you can pour it out, and then it'll seal, but crystallize is what it's called. I don't heat any, I just do one strain of honey filtration before I sell it to market or give away to friends. Does anybody garden at home or on campus? Would you guys think of starting a gardening committee and getting more flowers planted out in our lawns or talking to the landscapers here and saying, hey, can you let the dandelions and clover go for a little bit longer before you cut it? Maybe, just a thought, because there's a lot of campus here. <laughs> I, um, I have a, you know, my, my house is, you know, the backyard is much bigger than my house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have like a soccer field. And, and I feel so bad that, you know, I'm not a, like a garden person. Right. But I always, I always have that place that I don't like. I would like to do something in my backyard. I just don't know how to do it. I think it's, you know, I don't know, that's the idea that I have is so complicated. Uh -huh. And every time that I ask, um, you know, my landscaper and I say, uh, what do you think? Because I have so many little flowers all around. And he said, oh, no, we should put chemicals. You know, I, you know, I won't do that. You know, um, you know, like a before the spring, we can do something. And, and, and then I said, but I have my dog. I don't want him to get sick. Right. He said, you're gonna, you tell me that you're going to put chemicals. And he did it, you know, he did it uh, like it two times. And I didn't like it because my dog got so sick. Oh, my God. Yeah, and I stopped doing that. And I said, I don't know. I have to do something. It's just that I don't know how to do it. You know, probably like what you said, you know, buying little plants. Mm -hmm. Or you buy these little seed packets that say wildflower patch or pollinator patch and just sprinkle it in on the perimeter. What is the name? Like a wildflower seed or a pollinator seed packet. The Xerxes Society gives them away for free, I believe. But, but, but to hear that, like her dog got sick from a chemical that they sprayed in the lawn. Now, when we walk through those lawns, we're going to pick up that chemical on our shoes. We're bringing it into our houses, and if we have carpets, that stuff is going to stay there. And then we're breathing and living in a toxic environment just like the bees. And we may not feel like we're getting sick, but I'm sure we are. So it's important. Like, I understand the chemical companies have a place in our system somewhere, but the strength that they have over us right now is not fair. And we really, if we vote with our dollars by not buying these things and not going to those box stores, we will see a difference because their goal is money. And so if they're not gonna make money selling us chemicals anymore, then they'll change their mind, I hope. It's my dream at least. <laughs> it's time? Okay. You have a question? Last question. Uh, yes. Um, I happened to see um, something on TV a while ago, and it was, uh, I guess, the bee colonies in China mm -hmm. have collapsed tremendously. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I believe it was pear trees. There were absolutely hundreds and hundreds of people pollinating by hand. Yeah. I mean, going up into the trees and pollinating the trees because they had no bees. Right. And, I mean, China has a resource of a tremendous amount of people who can do that. But, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, that happening. You know, Americans aren't going to pollinate <laughs> trees. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm sure 
seen that happen in other countries, or is that just unique to China? I think it's unique to China. I forgot to mention that in my talk, but that's an important point, that who's a better pollinator, the bees or the humans? Well, hundreds of people. Yeah, yeah. and I'm going to vote for the bees. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everybody.